All right, all right. What's up, people? Here we are back for chapter number three. Me and my brother Tank. What's up, my brother Tank? What's going on, brother? What's going on, people? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with the chapter three, doing it as a audio book for the Dr. Claude Anderson book, Black Labor, White Wealth. All right, you got any opening words before we start, Tank? No, sir. Uh, well, no, nah, you know what? Just uh, uh, everybody be safe out there. And uh, and if you're spending your time with us, get some of this good old information. We appreciate that because you could be somewhere uh, uh, flat out drunk or something by now. <laughs> so we appreciate, you know what I'm saying, anybody that's going to be rocking with us right now. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. So we'll get ready to start here. Salute my brother, Mir. And here we go. Chapter number three. Impediments to empowerment and economic justice. Blacks ought, blacks ought not uh, swallow beliefs that they cannot digest. The U.S. Constitution has historically been and continues to be an impediment to black political and economic empowerment and self-sufficiency. During the formative years of this nation, the Constitution outright excluded Blacks from the privileges of citizenship, the acquisition of wealth and power, and the enjoyment of the fruits of their own labor. Moreover, the Constitution shackled Blacks so that members of the majority white society and any other ethnic or racial group could use Blacks for social economic gains. The social acceptance and grant of wealth that the government has given to Europeans, Asian, and Hispanic immigrants, but withheld from Blacks, left Blacks decidedly ill-equipped to compete with the more advanced groups. Worse, the con Constitution is again being used to block even the slightest efforts by Blacks to redistribute resources to remedy the wealth and power imbalance between blacks and whites. Conservative forces within the court system and government now seek to maintain the status quo of inequality between blacks and whites by mandating that blacks and whites be treated equally in all future endeavors. An effort whatsoever to correct past injustices are found to be unconstitutional forms of reverse discrimination against whites. Thus, equal protections has since has come to mean the equal treatment of fundamentally unequal groups, which in effect perpetuates the unequal distribution of wealth, power, and resources. White society enjoys a virtual monopoly over wealth, power, and governmental and business resources because to a large degree, of constitutional decree that whites would solely possess those advances. Equality for blacks, therefore, almost to anything other than the equal ownership and control of resources and power because the constitution sets the legal, civic, and racial tones of the nation and place numerous impediments and obstacles to black empowerment and self-sufficiency. The following is an analysis of the obstacles that the Constitution has used to impede Black people's progress. Obstacle number one, constitutional racism, termites in the foundation. The Constitution has formed the foundation of the subordination and exploitation of Black Americans by perpetuating racist attitudes and hurtful behavior towards Blacks. The Constitution expels values of individual rights, freedom, and opportunities, but gave slaveholders the legal right to deny Blacks their personal freedom to benefit from their own labor. Further, since the, frame, since the framers of the Constitution did not consider Blacks full human beings, they did not assign them individual rights. Thus, Blacks were never 
really meant to be included in the Constitution at all. Professor Harold Cruz spoke of this tragedy by stating, and this is quote, the legal constitution of America, of American society recognizes the rights, privileges, and aspirations of the individual. While America has become a nation dominated by social powers of various ethnic and religious groups, the reality of power struggles between competing ethnic and religious groups is that an individual has few rights and opportunities in America that are not backed up by the political and social power of one group or another. End of the quote. America is, in principle, a majority rule society. However, in areas of country where blacks constitute the major, constitute the majority of the population, all manner of legal and illegal means has been used to ensure that they nevertheless cannot rest control of whites, whether white, whether blacks were the majority population in Mississippi, Louisiana, South Carolina, or inner cities of the urban areas, a white minority controlled the balls or controlled the halls of government. The framers declared the nation to be a democracy while operating a Southern uh, pluto plutocracy a government run by a wealthy class of plantation owners. In 1786, the framers of the Constitution laid the legal foundation for a black-white wealth and power and balance by, once counting blacks as three-fifths of a person, postponing for 20 years the effective date for outlawing the slave trade, three, obligating the government to defend fugitive slave laws, to, and to use its forces to suppress blacks, black insurrections and violence. The federal government was a co-conspirator in black slavery. The constitution placed white wealth interests over black personal rights because the framers were wealthy, conservative white men. More than 31% of the delegates of the Philadelphia convention were slaveholders who together owned approximately 1400 slaves. The framers were ide ide idealists, but they also, but they were also racist. James Madison and George Washington were two of the larger and more posturous, prosperous of all the con constitutional delegates. Their capital investment in slaves will be worth approximately $105 million today. They and their fellow delegates protected their own slave investments and the nation's free labor system. The delegates believe that black slave labor was necessary for the development of the nation and the prosperity of white Europeans in this country. All of the nation's power and wealth were in the hands of white males. Any anti-slavery sentiments that might have been voiced did not prevail. The well-being of blacks was not a concern. The framers spoke out against concentrated power in the hands of British, but ignored the concentration of power within the own develop, developing uh, 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 aristocratic ranks. The accumulation of all power in the same hands, whether one, whether of one, a few, or whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, cautioned James Madison. In these quote, James Madison says, may, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny, end of his quote. If the concentration of power in British hands constituted tyranny, why was it that, why was that not so when it was concentrated in the hands of white col colonialists? Blacks became permanent victims of a tyrannical majority. When, they are, when their lowly roles in the, was inscribed into the founding document, the framers obviously did not foresee a time when blacks would be anything other than slaves. The constitution fused the broad concept of property ownership and related rights with English slave laws. Once blacks were classified as property, 
the English insist that slaves as property had no rights beyond the right to perform as requested. The framers codified in the Constitution their beliefs that property ownership rights were superior to slaves, human rights. A slave owner, many of the framers believe in the old English law that whomever discovers or owns a person or thing has inherent rights over them. Obstacle number two, racism in the Supreme Court and the legal system. The Supreme Court has been a major player in the denigration of blacks. It has exercised powers that the Constitution never gave it in order to overrule the United States Congress in the famous 1857 Dred Scott decision that concluded that blacks had no rights, the Supreme Court made itself co-equal to the United States Congress and began issuing rulings that declared congressional acts to aid blacks were unconstitutional. According to the Constitution, courts were supposed to be sanctuaries of, judi of judicial objectivity, fairness, and justice. It is ironic then that for nearly 200 years, only wealthy white male lawyers served in the high court. And even today, they are the overwhelming dominant class of judges and justices. The judicial system cannot be fair and impartial to all citizens because judges' decisions naturally reflect their experiences and beliefs. How fair and impartial to all is a judicial system that is composed of 99% conserv conservative white males? How unbiased are the court's decisions when the judges are appointed or elected because of their social and, polit and political ideologies? The Supreme Court's interpretive freedom is both its strength and its weakness because as a political appointees, the justices and to some extent reflect the views and philosophies of the appointing president and seek to maintain the status quo. In his book, A People's History of the United States, which I highly recommend by the, uh, by the way, that's a great book. Uh, in his book, A People's History of the United States, uh, historian Howard Zinn lamented the court's biased class interest stating that, quote, despite its look of somber black robed fairness, the Supreme Court was doing everything it could for the ruling elite, end quote. Only the politically naive would believe that presidents would appoint individuals to the Supreme Court who did not hold socio-political views on race matters that were similar to those of the president. During the 1980s, the litmus test for judicial appointments was support for the conservative cause on race matters as drawn from the Constitution and not case precedents. The conservative slap in the face to Black America was the appointment of Clarence Thomas, a Black man to the Supreme Court. Thomas, an ultra right wing conservative, sees the world through the eyes of the white uh, framers of the Constitution, rather than those of Black America. Former President George Bush said, quote, Clarence Thomas was the most qualified candidate in the country who knew what it was to be poor, end quote. In a Washington Post article uh, on April 18th in 1994, columnist Jack Anderson disagreed with George Bush on both accounts. According to Anderson, quote, Thomas's writings and decisions denote someone who disdains the downtrodden and is callous about protecting civil liberties, end quote. Thomas's court opinions supporting the beating and handcuffed prisoners, gender discrimination in selecting juries, and denial of immigrants' rights to Black Haitian refugees show him to be a judicial activist whose legal interpretation parallel the views of the drafters of the Constitution. 
Supreme Court decisions are based on the Constitution. But since the original intent of the Constitution was to enslave Blacks and deny them their humanity, fairness for Blacks is impossible. To change conditions and make them sympathetic to Black goals of empowerment and wealth would be to drastically change the intent of the framers. If judges rely on original intent, Blacks would have no rights. According to Eric Black, there were serious disagreements among the framers on many issues, but on the specific issue of slavery, the framers' original intent was crystal clear. The framers intended to approve and codify the subordination and exploitation of Blacks into law. They, intend, they intended to reward slaveholders and give them extra representation and power in Congress. And they intended to make it unconstitutional for anyone to attempt to harbor or assist a black slave. Seemingly, these intentions were very strong forces underlying the Constitution. It is likely that blacks would have continued their battle for constitutional rights in the 19th century had they not been discouraged by the Supreme Court's unrelenting pattern of biased interpretations of black people's rights under emancipation and the 14th Amendment. A critical examination of court rulings and the legal status of black Americans prior to the 1954 Brown decision should make even the hardiest optimists wonder why Blacks would try to seek protection from any court, especially the Supreme Court. Over the last century and a half, various court rulings followed a circular course from indifference to hostility to benignity. The Supreme Court stood silent while lower courts emasculated the 14th and 15th Amendments. There were few, if any, favorable rulings for Blacks during the first 160 years of the court's existence. The Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision in 1857 reflected their prevailing attitude towards the legal rights of Blacks. Although it had taken 11 years for the case to reach the Supreme Court, the ruling was swift and sure. The Dred Scott decision stated emphatically that neither free or enslaved Blacks were considered to be city citizens and hence could not sue for their freedom. Representing the, major, uh, representing the majority opinion, Supreme Court Justice Taney wrote, quote, Blacks are inferior beings and as property, they lack citizenship and have no rights that a white man is bound to respect, end quote. Following the Civil War, Congress, for partisan reasons, modified the Constitution to eliminate the most egregious wrongs against Blacks. In the, in the late 1860s, Congress enacted the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. These constitutional amendments were specifically enacted to, to abolish slavery, grant Blacks citizenship and equal protection, and establish voting rights for Blacks. However, the Supreme Court emasculated the 14th and 15th Amendments with a succession of unfavorable court rulings that restored Southerners' control over Blacks. The court's aggressive and negative rulings against Blacks accelerated after emancipation. In 1883, the court voided the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and refused to strike down discrimination by individual citizens. In 1896, the Supreme Court further reinforced its notion that Blacks were not to be respected when it gave its blessing to the Jim Crow system of separate but equal in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. The separate but equal doctrine 
hung a cloak of respectability around 60 more years of unbridled discrimination against blacks. The succession of anti-black Supreme Court rulings and the, com the compromise of 1877 obliterated the purposes of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments for, nearly, for, for newly freed slaves. In the, comprom in the compromise of 1877, the, North, the Northern champions of the black cause compromised to accept the Southern race system. The Southern conservative and wealthy class then experienced little difficulty in persuading the Supreme Court to ignore other constitutional revisions on behalf of blacks. Following the Civil War, history repeated itself. Southern whites again had control of the land, but had neither money nor labor. For the second time, black labor was commandeered and used to develop the Southern economic and social structure. The Southern states passed highly discriminatory black codes to keep blacks in a position of servitude. The codes and uh, the codes, a mandate for slavery, gave white Southerners a manageable and inexpensive labor force. The codes and subsequent laws and ordinances as indicated in the appendix, made it illegal for blacks to engage in normal social behavior, such as owning a dog, looking out of the same window that whites looked out of, raising and selling agricultural products, crossing a state line, and being on the street after dark. The nature of these black codes effectively notified the 13th Amendment and permitted local law enforcement agencies to arrest blacks and place them in involuntary servitude as, quote, criminals who had been duly convicted, end quote. It was common for local sheriffs to provide Southern planters with imprisoned blacks for free labor. Blacks were forbidden to work without written contracts. They were also forbidden to learn to read and write. Though they could not read legal contracts, they were bound and in all too many instances were arrested for having breached or broken the terms of their sharecropping agreements. The 13th Amendment contained an exception clause that cleared the way for nearly a century of involuntary black servitude because blacks had no income alternatives. Although the government had promised compensation to slaves upon emancipation, blacks never received the promised 40 acres of land, tools, or the mule. Abandoned without resources, most blacks freedmen had little recourse but to accept the white planters' terms. In some Southern states, advertisements invited blacks to voluntarily re-enter slavery for the benefit of the South, the old white masters and the nation. Just as the socio-political context nullified the effectiveness of the 13th Amendment for blacks, it also made the 14th Amendment a dead letter for blacks. The Equal Protection Clause was written into Constitution as part of the 14th Amendment in 1868, but it wasn't until 1954 that this language was interpreted to make it unconstitutional to overtly and explicitly discriminate against blacks. The court interpreted the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments broadly and applied them to many situations unrelated to blacks. By the turn of the century, the court used the new, constitution, the new constitutional amendments primarily to protect the wealth of major corporations. In 1886, the Supreme Court used the 14th Amendment on equal protection and due process to abolish 230 state laws that regulated corporations. 
corporate legal counselors argue that corporations were quote unquote persons and their money was property protected by the due process clause of the 14th amendment of the 14th amendment cases brought before the uh, Supreme Court between 1890 and 1901, only 19 dealt with blacks versus 288 with corporations. The court showed favor to the corporations, but it ruled against blacks in all 19 cases. The court refused to hear the majority of cases involving blacks who were openly disenfranchised, exploited, terrorized and lynched by the powerful and wealthy. Between 1882 and 1892, approximately 2,600 blacks were lynched. Next section, obstacle number three, absence of group economics and capitalism. The practice of perceiving and acting on issues and events from a social rather than a capitalistic perspective is a major impediment to black empowerment. An old adage says, quote, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, end quote. Blacks are in America and America is a capitalistic nation. Thus, blacks will have to adopt the American capitalistic approach if they are to build their economic strength. The founding fathers intended this nation to be an experiment in capitalism. Dr. William E.B. Du Bois, the preeminent black scholar, once described the concept to a black audience in Atlanta. He said, quote, capitalism is like having three ears of corn. You eat one, you sell one, and you save one for seed for next year's planting, end quote. Using Du Bois' definition as a measuring device, Blacks have yet to practice capitalism. Black people are neither producers nor savers. Primarily, Blacks are consumers. Blacks spend 95% of their annual disposable income with businesses located within white communities. Of the 5% that remains with the Black communities, another 3% is spent with non-Black owned businesses. It is difficult, if not impossible, for black communities to maintain a reasonable quality of life and be economically competitive when only 2% of their annual disposable income remains within black communities. Conditions in black communities are made worse by the fact that too many black business owners believe in developing their business, but not the black community. They are short-sighted in valuing temporary business development above long-term community development. USA Today reported on April 11th, 1994, that approximately $9 billion that went to black eight businesses from government set-aside contracts, nearly all of the black businesses were located in white communities. The tax revenue and jobs from these government contracts went into white rather than black communities. But supporters of the programs explain that they were fostered, quote unquote, minority businesses, not community development. With black consumers and black businesses spending 95% of their income in white communities, whites live comfortably off double incomes reaping 100% of their own and 95% of Blacks' income. Essentially, Black consumers and businesses uh, and business owners have joined whites in boycotting Black communities. Their failure to practice group economics further impoverishes Black communities. Obstacle number four, Pursuing myths and elusive dreams to achieve economic power, Blacks as a group must redesign civil rights traditions. Blacks are out of sync with the times and are still chasing civil rights. 
The process of rethinking our civil rights traditions begins with re-examining America's race problem from the perspective of black economic and political empowerment. The section below explores myths or dreams that are to their detriment. In myth number one, integration. Real integration is a dream that will never come true for blacks. Even if it did, it would not change the nature of black life in America. The reality of integration is that the integrating group loses all self-determination since all plans and goals must be processed through and approved by dominant society into which the majority, the minority group is integrating. Integration is a detriment to blacks because the larger white society will neither allow blacks to assimilate nor give them assistance to alter the negative marginal conditions in which they must live. Black businesses and individuals situated in and wholly dependent on the continued acceptance and goodwill of white communities are, are, are vulnerable and powerless. They cannot change anything in the white communities or businesses because they are only guests. Integrated Blacks conditions are made more precarious by the reasoning that they have little, if any, support within the white community and they cannot depend upon receiving support from the Black community whose, power were, whose powers were weakened by those who abandoned the community to integrate. Similarly, it is difficult for the non-integrated Black masses to identify with the integrated few. Therefore, both the integrated and the non-integrated are rendered powerless by their social division. Power flows from the group, the trunk of the tree, not in reverse from the individuals, from the individual or the limb of the trunk. So, as long as black masses remain powerless than ever, black individuals remain powerless and vulnerable, even if they are, or oh, even if they are, their businesses are integrated. The integration process has a major political significance in large urban areas where blacks are in control of government apparatus. When blacks are the majority population and are controllers of government, the last thing they should be concerned about are integration and minority development. It is self-destructive to continue to behave as a powerless minority seeking integration when, one, when one's group is the dominant majority population. While urban revitalization plans should be built around economically and politically empowering cities, black masses, Black elected officials are reading outdated development strategies that suggest the best way to help Blacks is to re-attract whites into the city. Such development philosophies are racist and short-sighted. It confirms the belief in white sup superiority and Black inferiority that Blacks cannot govern or progress without white involvement. Man, some way, real shit that he spoke. Integration will be a no-win situation for Black people until they have sufficient racial power, wealth, and competitiveness and respect. At that point, integration will become just one of a number of options open to them. In summary, once Blacks gain power uh, uh, purity, they will have the option of integrating or separating. Currently, they have no such choices. Integration requires Blacks to give up their culture, values, and all that is identifiably Black. The integration process is divisive and detrimental to Blacks' self-empowerment goal because it dilutes and fragments their numerical strength, placing them further into the minority in a nation whose political principle is that of a majority rule. Black people are the only group of people, ethnic or racial, that has consistently sought to integrate and continue to seek integration through white society. I mean, though white society has repeatedly 
rejected them. Once blacks began to integrate, they abandoned their businesses, schools, and communities. They also lost disposable, disposable capital that is now redirected to white communities. They even lost their middle class black role models who followed whites into the suburbs, who follow whites to the suburbs. The loss of black capital and role models has left black communities across the nation impoverished and without leadership. And worst of all, under integration, black people have had to shape their goals, values, and behavior around white America's standard through white approval likely, though white approval likely will not reap financial or political gains for black people. Here we go on to myth number two. Myth number two, equal opportunity for all. Black America devotes a significant amount of time and energy chasing the myth of equal opportunity, which was the forerunner of the dream of racial integration. Both the myth and the dream are improbable. Inequality of power and wealth will naturally exist so long as human greed and competition motivates human behavior. On the other hand, the myth of equality does perform an invaluable services for those who hold a disproportionate share of the wealth, power, and material resources. This myth not only keeps Blacks distracted from learning how to increase their share, but it keeps Blacks believing that at least their children or their children's children will have a fair chance at the brass ring. The greatest service that the myth of equality provides for the dominant power holders is the ideal that if Blacks are not successful, achieving a fair share of power, wealth, and material resources, it is their own fault. Integration and equal opportunity are grounded in the belief that dominant white society will voluntarily share power with Blacks. Power is rarely shared, especially between competitive groups. Power holders have no desire for equality. James R. Uh, Kluger, Klugel, and Elliot R. Smith in the research for beliefs about equality show that white resistance resists changes regarding racial inequalities because they tend to classify inequalities that relate to black underclasses as non-issues. Many whites do not believe that structural limitations impede, impede blacks. Some even believe that if individuals would coexist with their social peers and stop trying to integrate, inequality would not be an issue. Everyone will then be in common groupings. They re they uh will be in common uh, groupings. They reason, whites will accept blacks as equals only when blacks have acquired purity of wealth and power. Pursuing the concept of equality rather than the basis of equality, which is wealth and power, is a quagmire that bogs blacks down and wastes their time and efforts. Conservative logic holds that if all people acknowledge that America is race neutral, then blacks have achieved their long sought equality without whites ever having to redistribute resources and power to blacks. Through the 1980s, conservatives checks, checkmated blacks on preferential policies and quotas by arguing that America is a colorblind society and all governmental policies should be race neutral. The only way America would ever be colorblind is if everyone literally lost their sight. Conservatives have learned to use black rhetoric against blacks. They argue that any decision that is race conscious violates the 14th Amendment and is, oh, and is therefore unconstitutional. However, without preferential treatment, 
our affirmative action for blacks, structural racism will continue to advantage whites. This is why, oh, this is the way the power holders want it to be. If white, uh, white power holders had wanted blacks to have equality, they would not have kept them outside and beneath mainstream society for nearly 400 years. Let me get uh, myth three and four uh, ready because these myths are, uh, are oh, yeah, yeah. Several, several pages long. All right. Myth number three, eradicating poverty. The way an individual or group perceives itself is a critical determinant for of their driving goals. Though blacks bear a disproportionate burden of poverty, it is a self-limited exercise in futility for them to overly identify with poverty programs and policy. Poverty is a given in life. Affluence is poverty's fixed extreme. Both poverty and affluence are horizontal, social, and economic characteristics that inflict themselves on all racial and ethnic groups, regardless of geographic locations. Blacks ought to be realistic in their approach to poverty and poverty politics. Although poverty is a relative state among groups of humans, it is a given fact of life. It cannot be eradicated. Poor people's marches and government-sponsored poverty programs cannot eradicate poverty. And even if government policies and programs could eliminate property, poverty, the conservative wealthy elite would not allow it to do so. Due to limited black resources, it would be far more productive to view poverty as a vertical characteristic and concentrate efforts not on eradicating it, but on providing uh, as many blacks as possible with the education, wealth, and power building tools they need to lift themselves out of poverty. Myth number four, cultural diversity. Cultural pluralism and diversity have become very popular buzzwords, yet the American melting pot has proven to be an optical illusion. Cultural diversity is a term used to equate Blacks with other groups, though they are not. As a recent newspaper article reported, quote, the demands of immigrant groups and others diluted and eventually trivialized the very special claims of Blacks for national attention, end quote. Blacks are models of ethnic, racial, and gender groups, yes. However, a multicultural or cultural diversity ethnic that equates all subculture grievances with those of Blacks belittles and neutralize Blacks' efforts to resolve their unique dilemma. Cultural diversity gives the dominant society unrestricted entry to Black culture while socially and economically excluding Blacks from white culture. Black culture is allowed to assimilate, though Blacks cannot. For every ethnic group except Blacks, cultural diversity has advantages. Main streets throughout America reflect the nation's cultural diversity by featuring Chinese, Japanese, Mexican, Italian, Greek, French, East Indian, Vietnamese, and Cambodian restaurants. These groups have the option to assimilate into the mainstream with their culture intact. They establish other businesses, economies, and their own communities. Blacks don't have that benefit of an identifiable culture of their own. A mismatch of African heritage or quote unquote soul and black history is offered as black culture. Cultural diversity or pluralism would be advantageous to them if all things were equal, but they are not. Myth number five, black ethnicity. Contrary to the popular rhetoric of social engineers, 
political pundits and politicians, blacks are not ethnic. Ethnicity, oh God, I'm jacking up. Ethnicity is the sharing of common <clears throat> of common language, religion, culture, and sets of racial characteristics. But blacks in this country are an amalg an amalgamated an amalgamated racial group. They share the English language, but belong to every religious group. Have no clear cut culture and have a racially mixed family tree. Therefore, the concept of ethnicity does not aptly describe blacks and should not be used to merge black interests with those of other groups. There are those with uh, with species uh, with species species sorry. There are those with species motives who attempt to classify blacks as an ethnic group in order to blame them for not having reached purity with their with others with other ethnic groups the movement to classify blacks as ethnics is politically slight of hand that springs from mo from modern conservatives attempts to promote their own so-called colorblind political strategies if blacks permit themselves to be classified as as an ethnic group blacks will suffer a major political loss Leslie Mc, uh, Lee Moore of John Hopkins University defines an ethnic group as those, and this is quoted, who differ culturally from the dominant population, but share enough characteristics with the main population to be accepted after a period of time. Ethnics are viewed as allies of the majority white community because they share common characteristics non-black skin, immigrant backgrounds, absence of slavery legacy. Blacks have shared American culture for nearly 400 years and have yet to be melted into the mythical melting pot. Classifying blacks as an ethnic group sets up for a new round of benign legut. Myth number six, sexism is equal to racism. The form, degree, and intent of discrimination against blacks and women has always been vastly different and therefore should not be treated equally. Blacks were legally subordinate, subordinated and exploited as producers of wealth and human comfort for a society that denied them the right to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Contrarily, Women as a protected class enjoy the fruits of every black worker's labor, but were denied the luxury of laboring with blacks to produce such fruits. Therefore, sexism is more a class issue and a class struggle. Equating discrimination against women to discrimination against blacks is like comparing a headache with cancer. Being a woman is a mainstream, oh, being a woman in the mainstream society may have its challenges, but it can, but it can in no matter be compared to being black in America. Yet in the 1970s, the two struggles were linked. As one insightful writer noted, and he quotes, the class category of women was placed in the same category as blacks, not only as being oppressed, but as suffering the same degree of segregation, exploitation, and discrimination as Blacks. The constitutional violation of the rights of women to equal citizens, citizenship were equated with constitutional violations of the rights of Blacks, end of the quote. Nothing could be further from the truth. Though such social devices as families, marriages, and uh, racial segregation White women have had access to the fruits of white males, power and wealth. Blacks have not. From a racial perspective, white women always had had the advantage of enjoying the fruits of racial discrimination and the options of categorically discriminating against, discriminating against blacks. Blacks have never had a counter option of discriminating collectively against women. 
Women's movement supplanted the black civil rights movement more than a generation ago and has generated a demand for women's power and sisterhood that now serves as a major impediment to black families unity and racial solidarity. It is no accident that every time blacks are on the verge of receiving relief from their oppressive conditions, the women's issue emerges. Both conservatives and liberals support the issues to dilute entitlement to blacks. The first attempt by women to press their own causes to the detriment of blacks occurred in 1870. Women tried to push Congress to write them into the Constitution under the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, which were specifically enacted to ensure that the freed slaves had equal rights under the law. Shortly after emancipation, Congress passed the 15th Amendment that ensured equal voting rights for all citizens, regardless of race, color, and previous conditions of servitude. Women's attempts to have gender included in the amendment failed. Reasonable congressmen felt that the Civil War had not been fought over the status of women, but for the freedom of five million black slaves. Women were not included in the 1860 constitutional amendments because they had never been excluded from society. The original constitution did not make reference to or exclude gender. Supreme Court Justice Joseph Bradley wrote in an 1873 editorial that men is or should be women's protectors and defenders. And throughout history, social customs have assigned women to a special privilege and protected class. Therefore, women did not need a special amendment. Some women's suffrage groups openly criticized Congress for its exclusive for its exclusion of women from the 15th Amendment. One prominent white feminist, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, used strong racist and elitist arguments against placing the enfranch enfranchisement of black males above concern above the concerns of white women. According to author Eric Froner, Stanton said, think of Sambo, who does not know the difference between a, uh, a monarchy or a republic, who never read the Declaration of Independence, making laws for Lydia Maria's child, uh, Lucretia Mott, and Fanny uh, Kimball. The feminist attacks attempt to drive wedge between black women and black men. Stanton spoke out in support of voting rights for white members of the sisterhood. The black, the black women, she contended, would be better off as, as the slave of an educated white man than a degraded, ignorant black one. Wow. Racism is Racism is different from sexism in both intent and effect. As so, uh, what is that? So, Jordan Truth, a black activist, heroine, and feminist, aptly noted during a women's convention in 1851. After listening to white males discuss white women as, as a protected class, she dramatically rose to her feet and said, that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches. Nobody ever helped me into a carriage, and I ain't, and I ain't, oh, says, oh, and ain't I a woman, she asks. I will work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have born 18 children, I mean 13 children, and seen and seen them most of all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. So John Truth point was that she suffered not because she was a woman, but because she was black. Had she not been black, she would have been in the same protected class as white females. Apparently, Sojourner's efforts to draw the distinction between race and gender fell 
death on deaf ears and continues to be inten intentionally misinterpreted. Feminists continue to compete against blacks. The issue of gender protection under the Constitution arose again in 1964 when a Southern congressman insisted that women be included in an amendment of the Civil Rights Act. However, equality of the sexes was a lesser concern than undermining the bill's power to help blacks. Racist conservatives rose up in support of the amendment. Representative George William Andrews of Alabama said, unless the amendment is adopted, the white women of this country will be drastically dis dis uh, discriminated against in favor of a Negro woman. This attempt to derail the civil rights movement succeeded. The amendment easily passed, signaling the start of a trend by liberal politicians and organizations to push blacks even further onto the black to the back burner by equating other categories of people who consider themselves equally aggrieved to blacks. The rights movement soon expanded to include not only women, but Hispanics, Asians, Jews, the handicapped, gays, senior citizens, immigrants, drug users, immigrant workers, the mentally ill, and illegal aliens. But the biggest push went for women, since even a racist white male knew that promoting benefits for women would be little more than redistributing wealth to his white mother, sister, daughter, or wife. Thus, the wealth and power would not leave the white race. Myth number seven, the popular feminist movement has injured the relationships between black and other services and necessary resources, end quote, said Haki R. Madhubute in his book, Black Men, Obsolete, Single, Dangerous. Madhubuti explained the conflict between black men and black women saying, quote, black women did not place themselves in this delicate position as a ward of the system. They have been ma uh, maneuvered and strategically used for the benefit of the white majority, just as the black men have, end quote. Although their gains have not been quite as spectacular as those of white females, black females have improved their historical advantage over black males. Black women have always been more acceptable to the dominant white society. As with white feminism, black feminism has always been present, but has been fairly low key. Black women have always been able to find work when black males could not. They were more prefer preferable because they were less threatening. Black women are also beneficial for government reporting purposes. Since a black female counts both as a female and as a black. In 1954, the income of black women surpassed black males and the income, the income gap has continued to widen. Black women could work, go to school, socialize and breed with whites when black males could not. Slavery intentionally placed black women in matriarchal roles in order to dominate black men. Not only did such role reversals weaken the black family structure, they also placed the black female in closer physical and symbolic proximity to the white male. White males power position afforded them sexual access to black females. A white male with a black female mistress was an acceptable part of Southern life and was often part of the rights of manhood for young white males. Black males who were forced into a status below the black female were totally powerless to protect black females. Today, the rise of the quote unquote black sisterhood has the potential to be a divisive and destructive social phenomenon that could impede black self-empowerment. 
The Black Sisterhood here refers to Black women who have indirectly joined with white males and white females to further depress Black males. Using Black females to subordinate Black males places the race where it was centuries ago. In slavery, female slaves were typically field, quote unquote, drivers who set the work pace and task for male slaves. Though many worked alongside of the male slaves, they were usually given the easier management jobs, supervising children's crews and trash gangs. Within the household, black females were typically the surrogate overseers of the entire yard staff as well as the slaveholders' young children. The black females' advice was sought and accepted in family and household matters. Up until the civil rights period, the black females' domestic authority was exceeded only by the white masters and mistress. Black males as a class were never granted the full social and economic options to play out the male role as head of the black family and household. More than a third of black males today are unemployed, poorly educated, on parole, probation, or in prison and have a life expectancy that is 20 years shorter than a white female and 10 years shorter than a black female. Black males are, in, are an endangered species. That has been the that has been the case historically. They were enslaved on a ratio of two to one for every black female. As far back as the 1840s, certain Southerners, uh, I'm sorry, as back as far back as the 1840s, certain Southern states enacted an annual five dollar per capita tax on free black males in order to punish them for simply being black male and free. Racism historically has been a male to male phenomenon, a device to strengthen one's male's group at the expense of the other. Debates about sexism thwarts meaningful discussions about racism, further divides a weakened race, and underscores the weakened condition of the black male. Blacks are already the lowest among the ranking of racial and ethnic groups in America, if not the world. Some black women often fail to understand that if sex discrimination disappears, the white female will again simply join the white male on the veranda of the plantation house or in the suburbs and black women will once again serve the mint juleps. Obstacle number five, criminalizing blacks the criminalizing of Blacks, especially Black males, is a major obstacle to Black empowerment for at least three reasons. One, American, si American society has long linked crime to Blacks, especially young Black males. Two, Blacks have been forced to live in marginal social conditions that produce pathological social, I mean, pathological survival behavior. And three, Black communities lack an accountability mechanism that could establish, reward, and punish behavior that is detrimental to them. Since the late 1960s, Blacks have been so overexposed to Black crime within their communities that they now accept it as normal Black behavior. National public policies and institutions began centuries ago to produce and perpetrate the laws racial images and myths that imprison Blacks within the concepts of crime and violence. For Blacks, criminal justice has never been blind. White society criminalized Black behavior out of fears and financial self-interest. According to Leonard, Leonard uh, Curry, the author of The Free Black in Urban America in the years 18. 100 to 1850, Blacks were arrested for activities that would not have been a crime for whites, such as strolling in certain neighborhoods and looking suspicious. Hmm, that sounds familiar in 2000. 
Sometimes blacks were in prison for even less specific crimes, such as, quote, violating various city ordinance and, quote, playing games with whites. In some instances, no crimes were committed. White planters could commit blacks to prison, quote unquote, just for safekeeping. All of these incarcerations showed up in the records as black crimes against society. An abusive use of the legal system to criminalize blacks primarily occurred in urban areas where the white power structure had fewer options for controlling and using blacks. As far as back as the year 1826 in Massachusetts, free blacks were less than 1% of the population, but nearly 17% of the prisoners. In Pennsylvania, blacks were 2% of the population, but nearly 34% of the prisoners. And in New Jersey, blacks were also only 2% of the population, but nearly 50% of the prisoners. Today, blacks still make up 35 to 50% of the state or federal penal total population. Approximately 37% of America's black male population is either in jail or on parole or probation. The criminalizing phenomena has destroyed black individuals, families, and communities. The criminalizing of blacks does not excuse blacks who are engaging in criminal activities from being held accountable for their behavior. But the black communities should hold them accountable. Not only the majority white societies that foster the conditions that encourages blacks to commit criminal acts. Many blacks have in the past and will continue to commit petty blue collar crimes in the future. But all behavior is caused whether it is perceived as being good or bad. It should be noted, therefore, that black crime markedly increased at the, t at the same time and in direct proportion to blacks becoming obsolete and expendable as a labor class in the early 1960s. As black wealth, income, employment, business, educational, and male role model opportunities diminished throughout the country, black criminal activities increased. If American justice were to ever be colorblind, crime would have to be redefined and fairly enforced. For instance, white lawbreakers would not be treated any differently from their white collar crimes than blue collar criminals. The term white collar crime was coined in the year 1940 and referred to illegal acts carried out by respectable members of the community or persons of high status in the course of their occupations. And white collar crimes are usually nonviolent offenses carried out by respectable people to gain money, property, or personal benefits through deceit. John Fairley stated in his book, Sociology, which I highly recommend also, I have that book, I have that book for a couple of years. Um, John Fairley stated in his book, Sociology, that white collar crimes cost society from $40 to 200, I mean, excuse me, uh, the white collar crimes cost the society from 40 to $200 billion a year, not including the savings and loan thefts. This is eight times the cost of all common blue collar crimes. Yet our prisons are 99% filled with blue collar criminals who are predominantly black. With so many more expensive white collar crimes being committed, why are there not more white collar prisoners? Because most white collar crimes are committed primarily by whites and crime statistics are skewed towards reporting blue collar crimes. White collar crimes go to civil rather than criminal courts and are typically excluded from crime reports. When crimes such as inside stock trading, toxic waste dumping, 
embezzlement, bribery, income tax evasion, expense account padding, larceny, computer fraud, money laundering, extortion, blackmail, counterfeiting, government contract manipulations, and saving and loan thefts are included in the crime reports. The typical criminal turns out to be wealthy and white. In terms of acts of violence, personal injuries, and deaths, a California public health official stated that medically quackery causes more deaths in the United States every year than all blue collar crimes of violence. Yet, few quacks ever go to jail and none have ever been sentenced to the electric chair for medical malpractice. Even in the rare cases where individuals are arrested and convicted for white collar crimes, they receive light sentences and are frequently sent to resort prisons. Criminals should be arrested and prosecuted regardless of the color of the collar or color of the skin. Whites do not commit as many blue collar crimes. Their privileged status, contacts, options, and wealth gives them greater access to basic necessities, resources of the society without their having to commit criminal acts. Until black America breaks the shackles of black criminality, either actual or imagined, it will be very difficult, if impossible, for them to achieve economic and political self-sufficiency and self-empowerment. Conclusion. The greatest impediment to black empowerment and economic justice has been the Constitution, which institutionalized the relative social and economic status of blacks and whites and codified racism in America. After using the Constitution to exp expropriate black labor, create a racial ordering of acceptability, and foster a wealth and power imbalance between blacks and whites, the government and the court system are now using the Constitution to impede any effort to correct these disparities, to correct the disparities. The government and the courts now allege that any preferential treatment for blacks will be unconstitutional reverse discrimination. The Constitution ought to just be as supportive and tolerant of affirmative action set aside and preferential treatment for blacks as it has been for whites. Indeed, in all their wisdom, the drafters of the constitution had to have known that discrimination against blacks was in fact preferential treatment for whites. And that concludes chapter three, man, we have made it. And that's all we got folks. What's up, what you got on there Tank? Uh, man, thank you and appreciate y'all. We're closing out the year with some good old information and knowledge. Uh, and uh, Lord willing, tomorrow, if everything uh, is good with Reggie, we start the new year bringing some more knowledge as we start with Chapter 4. Um, you know, shout out to everybody that was in the chat today that uh, was chilling with us, man. Y'all could have been out somewhere partying. Maybe you are partying and just listening to us like an audio book. And if y'all doing so, be safe. Uh, stay blessed out there. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to uh, my brother Reggie Owens for the platform. Uh, shout out to Mir, G. Brown, Gump88, Jesus Hernandez, uh, Big Dog, uh, The Queen, Unique Don, uh, Be the Pugilist, H. Money, Andre Griffin, Joe Galadari, D. Hodges, Kenyatta Ali, B. and B. Boxing, and uh, Coco the Don. And I think that's everybody uh, that came into the chat today. You know what I'm saying? We really do appreciate We don't take for granted that people spend their time just to hear people read um, these books. Um, but we think that it's truly uh, uh, beneficial to our people. And even if um, you don't consider yourself to be black, what's up, Aru? Peace to you, brother. Peace and blessings. Um, even if you don't consider yourself to be black, you can still rock with these principles and apply them to what you do 
and who you rock with. Um, even though this is uh, these are what we consider things that our community uh, need, um, we do realize that we're not the only impoverished community out there and that others uh, can apply these principles, but we're not gonna hide the fact that uh, our goal is to uh, enlighten and evolve the thinking of our people because it is our people who need this right now the most. Um, so with that being said, continue to elevate. Uh, peace and blessings to everybody. You know what I mean? Everybody be safe and we'll see you here um, tomorrow. Peace. Uh, shout, out, shout out to Stormy B Man too. I see you, brother. Salute to the OG. And that's all I'm about to ask you, uh, uh, Tank. Would we be able to go on earlier? Because tomorrow I do the Friday night chop with uh, Stormy B Man. We'll, we'll, how early can you go on? Um, shoot, you can let me know, bro. I mean, I'll be available. Just text me, uh, hit me up like we usually do. Uh, maybe like a uh, an hour before you think you're ready. You know what I'm saying? You got you got kids and things that you got to, you know what I mean, work around. So you let me know, and then I'll, I'll hit you back and let you know if, uh, you know what I'm saying, that's good with me. So, I mean, we can do it earlier in the, uh, in the evening time. It's, it's uh, fine with me. Okay, so uh, 1 to 2 o'clock will be good? Yeah, that'll work for me. Okay, for sure, for sure. I'll, I'll send you the uh, send you the message. So I think about yeah, two o'clock or so will be cool. Yeah, about two o'clock is good. Just uh, remind me again. You know what I mean? Uh, hit me up and then remind me, and then that way I'll be in the frame of mind. Oh yeah, I forgot we are uh, readjusting the time. All right, for sure, for sure. So we'll be in here tomorrow, folks. We're coming in a little bit earlier for chapter number four. So we see you guys up in here tomorrow. Happy New Year's to everybody. And I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a New Year's show. So after midnight, I'm gonna be back on here for the for the actual New Year. Yes, sir. And, and last but not least, of course, always got to shout out Dr. Claude Anderson, the author of the book, for presenting the information that uh, we're putting out to our people. Salute to you, brother. While you still can uh, hear this and get your flowers while you're still here. Yes, indeed. And that's all we got, folks. We'll see you in the barbershop in 10 minutes. And I'll get the images. And these images have a very, very solid point to keep us in the mind frame of what American history has been like and the history that has occurred not so long ago. So these images may touch people in a certain way, may make you feel certain emotions, but these are images of how real ill shit has been in this country. And this is shit that this book is opening up to. But uh, check us out as we exit. Peace, people. <laughs>